I'm Betsy Peck, Learned Dean of University Libraries here at Roger Williams, and I'd like to welcome you to our first Talking in the Library event for this fall. In person, yay. <laughs> There's something to be said for Zoom, but in person is much better. Um, all of our Talking in the Library events are generously um, supported by an endowment to the university, to the library specifically, by an alumna of the university, Mary Tuft White, um, whose donation also made this program space, this room, possible. This evening, we're delighted to welcome Washington Post columnist and Around the Horn panelist, Kevin Blackestone. He will speak on the topic of Imagining the Indian, the fight against Native American mascotting, in conversation with Roger Williams' professor of writing, Brian Hendrickson. <laughs> professor Adam Braver, our library program director and professor of creative writing, will be introducing them both in just a moment. I'd like to briefly mention our next Talking in the Library event this fall um, on Tuesday, October 4th, which is next week. It's a little close. <laughs> we welcome the novelist Steve Yarbrough. And we are co-sponsoring this event with our neighbors at the Rogers Free Library in Bristol as part of their Jane Bodell Endowment. The event will take place at Rogers Free at 7 PM. Um, their address is 525 Hope Street. And I hope you all join us there. And now Professor Braber will introduce our speakers. Adam. Thank you. I will be brief and um, spare you a, my usual long introduction. Um, only to say, th uh, to give you a little background in really how this came to be is that um, I was watching the PBS NewsHour one night um, and the, um, the issue of Brian Flores, the football coach who um, had been fired and turned out to be the only black football coach um, in the NFL um, um, was hot in the news and um, and Kevin was the guest to, to speak about it and um, and I watched it and then Betsy it turned out Betsy was watching it and she texted me and said Do you see that? I said yeah I said and I said he's someone I'd like to know and Betsy said me too hence we had this um, um, in, you know let's invite him here to speak um, there have He's not going to speak on that. That's what we originally had thought he would, would speak on. Um, and as you can imagine, the, um, there have been numerous potential topics over the last year that, that we could have had Kevin come to address um, over and over. But, uh, but as it turned out, this, this documentary film, which he's been working on since 2014, Imagining the Indian, um, was, had just come out and it seemed like a good topic. It seemed like a, a, an appropriate topic for here, especially um, based on where we're situated, but also just what, what, what is in the air and something very present and important to Kevin. And as Betsy mentioned, Kevin um, is um, among m many things, uh, also a professor of journalism at University of Maryland, um, but is a columnist for the Washington Post on sports um, and very much so on cultural issues around sports. Um, and so this certainly ties in well. And, as, and again, our interlocutor uh, it would be Brian Hendrickson, who is again a professor um, here in uh, writing studies and also uh, you know, quite an accomplished poet for those of you interested um, in the world of poetry as well. So they'll speak for a while and then there'll be some q and I'll have a microphone to, to, to pass through the crowd if you have questions um, when we get to that point. So I'll leave it over to you. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to try to speak less um, than our guest here. I thought maybe we'd just start off um, with a clip uh, from, uh, from the documentary so that we're all a little familiar with it. Um, and then the way we'll do this is I, I have some questions prepared. We'll hopefully keep this um, a lively dialogue, but I encourage anybody else here in the audience who would like to ask a question um, of our guest to please feel free to um, raise a hand and let us know. Um, and we'll leave some time at the end regardless for you all to participate in Q&A. All right. Sounds good. And one thing um, I've become very conscious of in doing, uh, doing this work the last eight years is a land acknowledgement. Um, and I'm sure there's a land acknowledgement for this, this campus on this land. I don't know if one, anyone would like to offer it. Yeah, I'd be happy to.
So we recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. We acknowledge that Roger Williams University's Bristol campus is located within the homelands of the Poconocet. Let this acknowledgement serve as a reminder of our ongoing efforts to reconcile and partner with the Poconocet and all indigenous peoples whose lands and waters we benefit from today. So thanks for sharing that with us. Absolutely. First and foremost. Um, you know, I thought maybe for, uh, for our audience here who might not be familiar with um, your work, um, but certainly might not know much about this project or, or where it came from, um, I'm wondering if you could maybe say a little bit about how this project began and how it arose out of uh, your own career as a sports journalist. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite. Um, that was a five-minute clip from a 95-minute full-length um, documentary, uh, which I'm proud to say last week at the Human Rights Film Festival in Atlanta won Best Full-Length Documentary um, Award, um, <clears throat> which was the first time that we had, outside of Washington, D.C., um, it had played in a uh, city with a professional sports team that uses uh, Native American iconography and names um, to, to sell itself. Um, I, I'll start, uh, I won't give you a whole bio of me, but I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, I grew up in a, in a family that had season tickets to the Washington football team. Um, my parents took me to see those games before I could walk. Uh, I grew up inculcated as a Washington football fan. I lived, breathed um, with this team um, uh, every day of the year. Uh, and never once, um, even though I came up in a very progressive, progressive household, never once thought um, about the name of the team. Um, not until uh, the mid 1990s, when um, I was a uh, I was a sports columnist at the Dallas Morning News, and I was writing a column about uh, an NAACP fight in Midland, Texas, which is in the panhandle of Texas. And if you know anything about George W. Bush's um, rise to fame, that's where he started in an oil company um, after he moved, uh, moved from uh, up this way. Um, and the NAACP fight was against Midland Lee High School. Lee coming from General Lee, the Confederacy. And the school draped itself in all forms of Confederate imagery. And the NAACP was upset that their um, sons were scoring touchdowns and uh, points on the basketball team um, while the song Dixie might play in the background of the Confederate flag might flap in the wind in the, uh, in the stands. And they were upset about that, and rightfully so. And it was easy for me to identify with that. And that was about the time where, when I first experienced or heard that Native folk might be upset with the name of the team that I grew up rooting for. And it was the first time that I started to make um, a connection between how I would support the NAACP in their fight against Midland Lee, and why I should also support and understand Native folks' disagreement with the name of the football team I grew up rooting for. So that was really the that was really the seed. And into the late 1990s, I started to talk to more people about it. I started to come to an understanding. I started to try not to say the name myself. Um, I kind of cleansed my wardrobe of, of any uh, merchandise with that name on it. Um, I tried to remove it from my writing when I was covering a Dallas Washington game and I'd have to remind copy editors to leave it out that I purposefully was not using it. Um, and uh, when I moved back to Washington DC in the um, late, early 2000s, 
Uh, I actually got to know Suzanne Shon Harjo, who has been at the forefront of this movement. She lives in Washington, D.C., has been there since, um, uh, since the early 1970s. She grew up in, um, in uh, Indian country in Oklahoma. And began to talk to her about it. And in 2014, um, there was a case bef before the Patent and Trademark Office um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, which um, canceled the trademark for the Washington football team. And I thought at that point that um, the name was going to fall into the ocean and be washed away. Um, and I talked to a friend of mine who's a filmmaker by the name of Sam Bardley. If any of you ever saw the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary on Lynn Bias called Without Bias, he did that. Um, and we had been kicking around some ideas, and I said, we need to document this fight that this woman and Native folk have won against the multi-billion dollar industry of the NFL. Um, this is really interesting, and it happened right in our backyard, and we should do it. So that's how I got involved in trying to make a film. So it seems like this was both something that you had maybe a deeper history and connection to, but also that there was some amount of, of, of a learning process that might have come through the engaging in the process of making the documentary. And, and I'd just be curious to know ab about that. What are the things that you uh, learned through doing this that you, you didn't know before you went into the process? That would be an entire class. <laughs> That's about filmmaking, which I knew nothing of other than being a fan of film, and in particular documentary film. Um, uh, there, was, there was so much to learn. Um, first of all, I had to figure out what it was we were going to try and do. Like, what, we're going to make a documentary film. Okay, what's it about? What's our purpose? Um, what do we want to get out of it? Um, and why do we want to do it? To two brothers from Washington, D.C., we're not native. I'm not really, I wasn't drawn to this in the beginning because of the native community. I was drawn to it because I felt I should have a sensitivity to it, given that I'm a black man in America. And I'm a black fan of this team in a predominantly black city, Washington, D.C., and that other black people should be sensitive to this issue. Um, so once we figured that out, then we had to figure out, well, how do we tell this, this story? And we had both gotten to know Suzanne Shon Harjo, and so we thought that given her stature in uh, the Indian community, um, as well as her stature in the civil rights community within this country, um, she had been awarded a, um, a Presidential Medal of Freedom by, uh, uh, by President Obama um, for her work with uh, her work in, in the indigenous community, um, that we would tell the story of this fight um, using her as a vessel, um, a, a narrative. Um, uh, but then we realized there was even more to tell. We had to figure out the context for this. And the context was historical. You know, what has been the history of native people um, on this land um, since Europeans first arrived. Um, and it is, it is a genocidal history, um, one that's not told in full um, enough. Uh, so we had to figure out how to do that. Um, and then we had to figure out where we are today and where we're trying to go. Um, this is going to be a protest film where we are protesting for these names to come down and these are the reasons why. The difficulty was, and you, you mentioned it, and Adam mentioned it, started working on this in 2014. Well, we wound up chasing, chasing news, which we didn't really anticipate. Um, things were changing all the time on this particular issue. Um, uh, there was a Supreme Court case that came out involving a, um, a, a rock band, an Asian rock band, 
um, up in the Pacific Northwest called the Slants, which sued for the right to use their name, even though it was considered is considered a disparaging um, remark about Asian folks. Um, and when they won their case, um, that had a direct impact on the Washington football team and a decision it champion to hold on to their name. If the slants could do it, then we could do it. Um, even though that was an uncomplicated way to talk about it. Um, and then we, we realized that we needed to have, um, as we expanded this, we needed to have um, uh, some native representation. And so fortunately, we were introduced to Ben West, who also is from Washington, D.C., um, who is Cheyenne, um, who uh, graduated from USC um, uh, studying film and being a script writer and all of that. And he was very much interested in, in doing this film. And we were introduced to him through Aviva Kempner, who's the other co-director on this. And Aviva Kempner is, a, um, is an award-winning uh, documentarian in Washington, D.C., who for 40 years has made documentary films about um, Jewish heroes and heroines. Um, most recently, I think her most recent movie was, uh, I think it was Mo Berg, um, uh, who was a, um, a baseball player, a catcher in the 40s and the 50s, who became a spy um, for the U.S. government um, on, uh, on Japan in the run-up to, to World War II. Two. Um, she also did a great piece on Hank Greenberg, the great uh, Jewish slugger in the 30s and the 40s. Um, uh, and she quickly glammed on to this idea. So um, it then became a, a great team effort. Yeah, so the, I mean, that makes me think of two th connected things. Uh, and you've kind of pointed out that there's, there's, the, there's the learning curve involving and taking on a whole new medium, um, which I find, you know, really impressive. <laughs> um, and then there's uh, the learning curve in taking on this particular subject matter. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more possibly about, like, how did your understanding of the subject matter itself perhaps evolved through the process of, of making the film? Did you, did you come out thinking about it differently or more deeply by, um, by engaging in this process than when you began? Sure, no question more deeply. Um, our, our approach in the beginning, I think, and my thought process in the, in the beginning was, was, um, uh, was very much on the surface. It, it was what I had seen, um, what I had heard, um, but it wasn't what I had delved into. Um, and we started really to take a deep dive into um, Native history, um, Native culture, and the Native struggle. Um, uh, and so, you know, what I knew about Native American history, I'm not a student of it, but what I knew was they were here first, Europeans arrived, um, shoved them off their land, um, murdered them, uh, stuck them in reservations, um, tried to separate them from their culture, and there weren't many around. But I didn't know the impact that all of that had on not only their community, but the rest of us. Um, and uh, I think when we were speaking earlier, um, I talked about the interview with Amanda Blackhorse, who was the woman talking about um, uh, in the clip, who, who uh, talked about growing up and thinking of her skin color as being making her less, less than. And what you don't see in that interview, or maybe you can pick up a little bit of it from the glossiness of her eyes, <clears throat> is that in the course of that interview, uh, she broke down. Um, she was telling me about losing her job uh, by taking up this fight. 
Um, and she talked about losing her hair by taking up this fight. And when she mentioned her hair, um, she was just she was she was overcome, and we had to we had to stop filming. And it's the first time that I really understood the depth of this situation, like how deeply hurt Native people were and are by being reduced to mascots. Um, and one thing you have to know about Native culture is hair is, very, is, a, is a very important um, symbol of their being. Um, and I, I was reminded of this. I don't know if any of you guys watched any of um, uh, Ken Burns' latest documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust. But there's a, there's a bit in there where, um, uh, where they're talking to um, a woman who, um, a survivor who was in Poland, and I can't remember what city it was, but she talked about how she saw the Nazis um, drag the rabbi um, of, of, of the community synagogue out and, and then sheared off his beard. And like how devastating that was image-wise um, for, for, uh, for that Jewish community. And so I th it, it made me think about Amanda talking about losing her hair. So as you know, we, we we talk about this in a very disconnected way, right? We watch it, we see it, um, we hear people complain about it, but then to get that emotional reaction, that visceral reaction, um, I, that wasn't something I was prepared for. You know, you had said something I thought was pretty striking a minute ago, and you mentioned. Um, the effect that that history has on, on on all of us, and I wonder, you know, this one of the things I found really compelling about this clip was uh, not that not that you have to know, always have empirical research to show that something has a negative impact on a person or on a people, but just the laying out the sort of research based argument for the negative impacts that has that mascots have on on native peoples, and I wonder. Uh, are there are there negative impacts you think mascots this sort of the sort of mascotting of indigenous peoples has on on all of us? Um, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I thought about in doing this, and one of the things I've always thought about anyway, um, being a person of color in this country, is like, like, how did this whole racism thing start? Right? Like, well, why why are we still battling this? And you know, one of the reasons is exactly what happened to, to Native people um, when Europeans first came ashore and how they were, um, how they were treated, um, which was horrifically, um, that their culture was almost, um, uh, was almost removed from our national palate, um, that they were denigrated, um, and that if that could happen to them, um, then certainly you could do that to other people of color in this country. Because after that happened to them, then that's 1492, then fast forward to 1619, and it begins to happen to, um, to Africans who were dragged here across the Atlantic Ocean um, and enslaved. And so I think there is, a, there is a connection, and some of the research has shown that it has made it easier or more acceptable for the rest of us to denigrate others or to otherize others. Um, and, it, and it begins with that, with that relationship. And I hadn't really um, thought about that. I wasn't aware of that, that research until we, um, we delved deeper into this film. One of my personal connections to this, and I mentioned this to you before, is, um, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Florida, um, and, uh, and I did my undergraduate degree at Florida State. Um, and, 
you know, I was, I would say that I was pretty uncritical growing up in terms of race and racism. I was probably your typical Southern white middle-class kid. Um, and, uh, and if you had asked me as long as 10 years ago, well, how do I feel about the Florida state football team using the name of Seminoles? And I would, I would tell you the, the party line on that, right. That, uh, that well, um, Florida State has a good relationship with the Seminole Tribal Council. Um, I, I have to admit, I, I'm still I'm still a little perplexed by this whole thing, um, and I think it sort of speaks a little bit to maybe some of the complexities of um, of allyship and the kinds of decisions we make when we are not indigenous ourselves, how do we make sort of decisions about who gets to decide what or whether or not we should have an opinion at all. And I think unfortunately sometimes the complexity of the situation maybe prevents us from doing anything sometimes, uh, even when maybe the choice is clearer than others. So I, this leads me to two questions. One of them, of course, I wanna know, how do you feel about the Florida State sort of situation. Um, and then two, I'm just wondering, just through all this process, um, you know, has, has it shaped your sort of understanding of allyship or how to navigate the complexities of this or sort of what, is that, what does that mean for us to, to have to step into complicated issues that sometimes demand we make decisions, um, even when it's difficult to do that sometimes? Sure. Well, I'll, uh, um, what you didn't see was a part of the film where we discuss um, Florida State, and I'll just point this out: we have a uh, we have a, uh, a a clip of the mascot for Florida State um, being prepared to be the mascot to ride out as Chief Osceola. Um, that they call him. And so this student is sitting in this chair as someone puts paint on his face and a wig on his head and then uses some sort of material that I guess would mimic something that someone saw in Native American culture and Seminole culture um, around his head. And when I first saw that, um, I thought to myself, man, that's blackface. It's just red and, and yellow. Um, I, wouldn't stand, I wouldn't stand for that. Um, and then I thought back to some of the fans that I would see um, at Washington football games who would paint their faces red. Um, in fact, a self-appointed mascot of the Washington football team when I was growing up um, was a black gentleman who painted his face and wore a headdress, which by the way is sacred, um, and these fall Indian clothes and made these fall Indian sounds or what he thought were Indian sounds and paraded around the stadium. Um, his name was, he went by the name of Chief Z. Um, so what I'm seeing at Florida State, when I look at that film and I watch someone ride out on a horse and throw a burning stake into the ground at, 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 at the 50 yard line, is minstrelsy. So that's, that's my orientation towards that and those who participate in it. Um, the Florida State situation is complex, or I shouldn't say that. The Florida State situation has been made to be complex. And it's been made to be complex because Florida State has cut a monetary deal with part of the Seminole Nation that they've been able to um, negotiate with um, within that part of Florida. Um, and so they have a contract um, uh, in which a few things are meted out. But it needs to be pointed out that um, the Seminole Nation is very large. Um, it stretches beyond the state of Florida. 
Um, and there are, you know, for every Seminole who you might find in the state of Florida who's comfortable with that, that relationship with the university, um, which is theater, um, there are plenty who are not upset. I mean, that who are upset and would prefer that that, um, that that performance not be a part of, of Florida State. Um, so um, like anything, and we're seeing this now, we saw it with the Washington football team where the, the new owner has tried to buy, um, uh, buy the goodwill of, of native folks by parading them around the stadium from time to time and giving them awards or jackets or something like that. Um, to give this impression that uh, all of Native America is comfortable with the name, um, it, it's just not true. Um, but that's why I say it's not, it's, it's been complicated by money. It's been complicated by a strategy of pro football teams, or in this case, Florida State University, um, just so they can hold on to the name and hold on to that image and that and those histrionics before and after and during games. So what would you say to somebody who just feels like all of this, all of this politics and all of this talk about race, all of it's just like a big distraction from the game and loving the game. And can't we just get back to loving the game for the game and keep the politics and the conversations about taking knees and other things like this and racial represent can't can't we just love the game for the game and not have to think about this kind of stuff isn't that a conversation for somewhere else as my grandfather liked to say you don't talk politics and religion at the dinner table um, maybe he was partly right sometimes but what would you say to somebody like that well, first of all, I invite them to audit my class, um, which is called uh, Sports Protest in the Media, which is uh, part um, a historical look at the relationship between uh, sports and politics or serious issues, um, which go back to the beginning of sport. You know, the, the, the first um, uh, team sports or the first huge sporting events that were held were held um, uh, to honor gods. Um, you know, the, the marathon, which is probably the most iconic event of the Olympics, um, was um, uh, a political event. You know, it was a, uh, a messenger um, running back to Athens to deliver um, information about uh, a victory by the Athenian army. Um, you know, the whole reason that Colin Kaepernick can use the national anthem um, as a mixtape to his protest is because Woodrow Wilson decreed that a military band in public play this thing called the Star Spangled Banner, um, and it just happened to be a military band at the 1917 World Series, and they played the Star Spangled Banner, right? So um, sports and politics uh, have always been together. Um, and people who argue that that's not the case or they don't belong together um, know neither the history of sport nor the history of, of politics. Um, they've always gone together. They're perfect bedfellows for any number of reasons, uh, and you can enjoy the game, but you are hard pressed to ignore all the things that go around it, um, unless um, unless you absolutely refuse to acknowledge them. Like, how many people here have seen um, military aircraft in the air? How many people have only seen that at a, at a game at, during a flyover? 
right? Or, or are familiar with it, with a flyover. Um, uh, you know, that's been, other than going to one air show, which I didn't enjoy, um, because it, <laughs> it, it included tragedy, um, you know, that's where, where, where I've seen it. Um, you know, how many people in their regular work life um, start their day by singing the Star Spangled Banner? How many people have been to a movie and had to sing, sing the Star Spangled Banner? How many people have served in office and started your day singing the Star Spangled Banner? But go to a sporting event, you start that sporting event by singing the Star Spangled Banner. Why? Why is that continued? Um, I'm not sure. But I do know that if you go to some um, schools, I think Quaker schools do not play the Star Spangled Banner before games. I think that's right. Quakers are rebels, huh? <laughs> there you go. So Who would have thought? I do, I do want to open things up to our audience in case they have any questions, but I, I, I want to maybe close with one that I'm sure our audience also wants to ask you. Um, if in case you you know started googling around trying to find uh, you know where which streaming platform you can you can watch the full link documentary on right now you might come up short so I mean any word on when we when and how we might be able to see this thing yeah right now we're on the um, right now since uh, the movie uh, debuted in April we're on the film festival um, tour. Um, and one of the reasons you get on the film festival tour um, is you're fortunate to be selected by the ones you apply to. Um, but the other reason is to uh, attract distributors. Um, and that's where we're at, we're at right now. We're, um, we're, we're trying to get um, distributors for a theatrical release um, and a distributor for an educational um, package because we want to get this out to, um, to school. So at this particular moment, um, the full length is only available to um, uh, to, to uh, places where we've been selected um, to 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 uh, screen. One of which a few weeks ago was actually the Rhode Island International um, Film Festival. Uh, we it, it was selected there and it streamed there. Um, I think that in November, and I can tell you all later uh, when we play at the. Uh, we're, we're being screened at a program at the um, uh, uh, the Museum of, of, of um, the, the American Indian Museum in, in Washington, D.C. was part of the Smithsonian um, Institute. And I think that they're going to allow for several days, or we're going to allow them for several days to stream us on their, uh, on their project's platform. Um, but I'm not exactly sure what dates that that, that that's going to take place. So right now, um, uh, yeah, we're just we're we're only being shown at, at film festivals and some limited screenings. But we got a lot of them. We're in Calgary this weekend. If you want to get up to Calgary, you can catch us. Um, let me see what else we got coming up. And we're in Dallas the second weekend of uh, the second weekend of October. We're in Santa Fe. I. I forget what that date is. Um, we're back out in California for a date. Um, so we got dates. Oh, and we're in Toronto at Imaginative, which is the largest indigenous film festival on the planet. Um, and that's in uh, the third week of October. So if you want to get up to uh, Toronto. Well, uh, New Mexico is really lovely this time of year, so I might, <laughs> you might, run I might choose there. Santa Fe okay. instead. Well, um, thank you so much for sharing the clip with us, for uh, for being willing to share, you know, the story behind the documentary, and and of course your own sort of scholarly insights into um, sporting and uh, politics. I really appreciate you talking with me, and thank you. Um, with that, I might uh, turn things over to the audience in case anybody has any any thoughts or questions they'd like to share. Just don't ask me anything about fantasy football, because my team's 0-3 right now, and I'm not happy about our drafts. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty mundane. I think in the opening of the clip, you showed uh, Oprah Winfrey a shot of her in the show, and she used two phrases, and kind of wondering which of the two was accurate. 
and the Indian woman or one of the nations responded that neither is correct. What would be, what is the correct reference and or terminology? Um, it's a good question because the, uh, the museum is called the American Indian Museum. And um, being out in Indian country now and, and working with Ben West, I've found that that's acceptable to some, um, but not to all. Um, we are about to come up on what you know as Columbus Day. And as you know, there's been a movement in this country that's slowly getting more and more successful to either reclaim that um, or rename that or add to that name Indigenous Peoples Day. So um, for me, I, I've tried to use the word indigenous because it's, to me it's a more global term. Right, there are an indigenous people here, there are an in indigenous people in the other Americas, there are indigenous people almost everywhere we go. Um, and so I, f for me, that's, I'm, I'm more comfortable um, with that. I've also heard native peoples, which I also think is global and, and more inclusive. Um, you know, calling people Americans is really problematic, right, because they were here before Americas, um, and so that's really kind of inaccurate and kind of speaks to their um, being colonized. Um, I, 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 we were at a, this, was, this, this blew me away. We were at um, Sioux, um, Sioux St. Marie, Michigan. Anybody ever been there? Anybody here from Michigan? You, all know, you know, they do the hand thing, we're up here. And the, so there, it's the Upper Peninsula, right? The point of the top of the Upper Peninsula. And we were up there for their film festival. And uh, I just heard today we won audience award for there. So, um, but uh, the nearest big university, I think, is Eastern Michigan. And I think they go by the name of Chippewa. Everybody's heard Chippewa. And they still haven't, haven't changed that. Well, while I was there, and half of, basically half of, Sault Ste. Marie is, um, is reservation. And we were staying um, on the reservation side and we were being, um, uh, our, our host was a guy named Aaron Payment who is um, a long time Native American official at various levels at the national level. And um, he explained to us while we were there that Chippewa is not a real thing. That actually, Native folk in that part of the country, the, the nation is Obijawe. But Europeans mispronounced it as Chippewa, somehow, some way. And so that name just stuck. And so we've been calling Obijawe, I think that's how it's pronounced, which is not to be confused, I don't think, with the nation out of, oh, right. Right, um, which is in Minnesota. Um, T.J. Ochi of the Washington Capitals is, is of that nation. Um, so it just stuck. So, you know, we have been misnaming Native folk, Indigenous people forever, right? And being so disrespectful that we haven't asked them, as you did, maybe how we should refer to you. And one of the reasons that, that Suzanne Schoenhardt just said all are, are inaccurate is because Native people don't really, re don't really refer to themselves that way. They refer to themselves by what nation they're a part of, right? Um, you know, Cheyenne, they refer to themselves as Cheyenne or Muscogee. They don't refer to themselves as Seminole, but we have turned them into a monolith by just making them Native Americans, indigenous people, um, uh, American Indians, or, or whatever. Thank you. I see you there. Um, so in discovering more about the fight against um, like indigenous imagery, how did you kind of process or kind of 
grapple with your childhood memories or childhood identity associated with being a big fan of the team? It wasn't easy. Um, I mean, I, I mean, if you're a sports fan, you're a sports fan. It, it makes you irrational, um, right? Um, you know, I mean, I, 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 like I said, I lived and died with this team. In 1992, which is the last time this team was in the Super Bowl, um, I went just as a fan with some friends. And as we were walking into the stadium, and I tell this story in the film, I saw a, a commotion off to the side. And so I went over to investigate the commotion, and the commotion was a protest against the name of the team. And I'm standing there with the name, you know, probably on my cap, you know, on a sweatshirt. I mean, I'm decked out. Um, and that was really the first time I had witnessed any blowback to, uh, to the name of the team. And I really didn't pay much attention to it until that trip to Midland, um, Midland, Texas. So, you know, this is a part of my identity, right? You go away to college and people want to know, where are you from? Where are you from? You're from New Hampshire. So people may ask you if you were a fan of who you grew up as a fan of, maybe the Boston Red Sox, right? So maybe that's, you kind of identify with that. So you go away from home and that's, how, that's, your, that's part of your identity. That's who you are. So I go away to college. I'm from DC. I'm a fan of this team. My, my team is better than your team. I can't wait till we play each other, right? I mean, I, 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 I breathed that, that oxygen and I exhaled that oxygen. So, um, and as a progressive person, um, that really troubled me. And I, and I slowly but surely had to, as the, the, the owner of the team became more and more entrenched and more and more obstinate, over this issue, um, I really had to check myself. And I, I pride myself on being consistent. And my argument um, and my, my feelings were no longer consistent with what I was supporting. Um, and so it was hard. We have, um, uh, we display that in the film. There's a, a former uh, Washington DC city councilman um, who uh, was a, grew up a big fan, and he and his brother would go to games. Just, that's what you did. Um, and then he talks about how he became more conscious about the impact that this was having, how it was wrong, and he finally told his brother, his brother, I, I can't go to, we, we can't go into games anymore together. I can't, I can't do this. So that was a fracture in a family. You know, we have someone like, we have Jamie Raskin um, who grew up in Washington, D.C. You know, Jamie Raskin is, uh, he's really rising in, in the, on the political frontier right now, right? Um, and really a smart guy and very sensitive and very conscious. And, and it's not until really now that he has reached a point where he can't, the team that he grew up rooting for, he just can't, he can't embrace them anymore. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Sports are so, um, it's so much a part of our blood, blood stream. Um, it's really, really hard um, to go through the transfusion of getting that out of you. Um, it's interesting that this has really touched on emotion on both sides identity in terms of affiliation with a team. And then there's also the heritage aspect. Um, I live in a neighboring town that originally had the high school team named after, you know, the R word. Mm -hmm. And that was luckily dropped because of regionalization with another school, so they had to come up with a new name. But the, the men who were the athletes at the high school, and some women too, are now very entrenched in keeping that logo and image alive of a war bonnet to um, Native American. Um, there's even a, a you know cigar store version that was created as the mascot, and there's a museum showing items from the past. So there's been some reinterpretation. There's other little hidden things like the recreation department still uses that logo, which it really, I mean, 
And I'm sure it's because of their loyalty to the past and that people identify with it. You know? So it's, the, it's, we haven't really had the tough conversation that needs to be held, but it's simmering in the background. And it's another way that this has trickled down into our culture and it becomes very local, not just a national or regional situation. Oh, yeah. Because we do now have more um, activity and more attention to a local tribe. Yeah, and I think that's, that's really important. And uh, to your point, um, when we started doing this uh, film, uh, I may have mentioned this earlier, I can't remember, but there are over 2,000 secondary um, schools across the country that have, um, that use uh, the R word or some variation thereof. Um, and now there are less than 2,000. So, um, you know, we've been tracking this and we know that this fight is going on in communities um, all, across the, all across the country. Um, most um, are being successful in finding a new, um, a new moniker. Um, but we do know that there are some where it's been uh, a knockdown, drag out, um, and changes haven't been made um, for, any, uh, for any number of reasons. And that's one of the reasons why we want to do educational um, outreach with this film, put together um, study, um, a study guide, and get it out to schools so that people can understand the history that they're involved in. We have one last question there. Um, and, well, I'll just speak up. So since you're from DC, I wonder if you see parallels between uh, the lack of representation in the federal government for, for DC citizens and, and, um, and indigenous as well. I mean, it, it seems to me that there's sort of this erasure of representation, and I wonder if you have thoughts. Man, taxation without representation. I grew up with that in Washington, D.C. Um, I live, now live in, uh, uh, since I've moved back, I now live in, um, in Maryland. Uh, I had not made that connection, but it's, you're absolutely right. Um, it's, uh, it, it is similar, if not, if not the same. Um, you know, there's a, there's a fight on right now. This is one, one of the amazing things I did learn about um, Native history that I, I I probably should have known. We know about the treaties. We've all heard about the treaties. But the amazing thing about the treaties is how many of them have just been completely disregarded. Everybody signed on the dotted line, certain agreements, and almost none of them have been upheld. And so there's a story out right now about, um, about a treaty that the Cherokee signed. Did anybody hear about this? Um, with uh, back in 18, I can't remember what year it was, but it was to have a representative in Congress for the Cherokee people. And um, right now, and it's been it's signed and <laughs> ratified and everything whenever it was. And so right now someone has resurrected it to try and get Cherokee people represented as a nation um, on Capitol Hill. So, yeah, much of this has to do with lack of representation, either codified or just respectfully. Um, and so there is a, that is not a connection that, that we've made, but um, thank you for pointing that out. I had not thought about that. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, the Washington football team has played anywhere but Washington um, for ever since about 19, uh, I forget what year they moved to Mar the state of Maryland out of D.C., but sometime in the early 1990s. And uh, they're looking for a new location now, and chances are, I think, even though some things have happened to suggest otherwise, I think they'll wind up in Virginia, which is where their headquarters are anyway. Um, but that's a that's a that's a great through line. Um, lack of representation for for native folks, and lack of representation for what until the next census comes out will still be um, uh, an an unrepresented um, majority black um, city in this country. 
Well, I think we have to close out, but thank you so much. I, oh, Kevin, thank you. You've given us so much to think about, and um, I can't wait to see your film. I hope I get an opportunity to. I hope you do, too, very soon. <laughs> and, Brian, your questions were right on. They were really great. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you all for coming.